Thanks. This talk has three parts to it. Uh, I'm going to introduce um, my, my uh, entry into this, which was through African fractals, uh, generalizing what I found there to uh, a theory of generative justice, and then trying to apply that to various projects around the world. So 1877, the first fractals are made, uh, and they're very abstract. And this is really just mathematicians thinking about um, concepts like infinity. Um, and I'm going to go to our software that we offer on our site here. And, and uh, if you uh, have a laptop and you want to play along, but be my guest. So we've got our, um, our four lines here in this pointy little triangle looking thing. And all I'm going to do is replace that with a shrunken down uh, version of itself for each line. So that little pointy thing is that big pointy thing, but shrunken down. Everybody following me so far? All right. So I can do that again, um, and now those lines get replaced, and again, and now those lines get replaced, and so on. Um, and eventually I have a, a, a curve that has infinite length, even though it fits in a finite space. Um, and that's what the mathematicians found so intriguing, and what they also thought was so completely irrelevant. So they said, well, this will never be applied to the real world. Um, and there's nothing especially uh, 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 special about that triangle shape. So, so we, can change the, uh, we can change the angle here uh, and see what that makes. And um, we can change the angle uh, uh, in the other direction. Um, we can add in a line instead of subtracting lines. Uh, I spend way too much time doing this. <laughs> As you can see, it's, it's kind of addicting. Um, and it's a wonderful way of just thinking about kind of exploring a, a, a design space, right? A space of, of possible designs. Um, so in the uh, 20th century, Benoit Mandelbrot started doing these on computers and realized, wow, it's not the most irrelevant mathematics at all. It's the most relevant because nature is using these, these fractal shapes. Um, so for example, if you look at a, uh, a fern, um, that fern looks incredibly complex, but actually it's just three lines. And you can, um, you can mess around with that. So you can, you can explore that design space as well. Um, and maybe that's what, why nature is using uh, fractals so much. Uh, maybe nature as it mutates, as it adapts to different environments, is it, it's also exploring these different design spaces, right? Um, and people have come up with all sorts of interesting uh, applications for fractals. So it turns out that um, uh, you can do some predictions around uh, dendritic growth and turbulence. Um, you can apply fractals to antennas. So if you cracked open your cell phone, you'd actually see a little fractal uh, antenna in there because it's trying to do radio waves over many different scales, right? Um, so in uh, uh, the uh, late 1980s, um, I made this observation that when you uh, fly over an airplane and look down at these African villages, you tend to see fractals. You see circle, circular houses that are arranged in circles, and often circles of circles of circles. Or you've got rectangular houses um, that are rectangles of rectangles of rectangles. And I thought this was just an unconscious, bottom-up social dynamics, that any indigenous <laughs> society around the world would be doing this, that, that it was fractal for the same reason coral reefs or termite mounds are fractals. Um, so I started collecting these aerial photographs, and I realized the only fractal villages were from Africa. And so I thought, well, there must be actually knowledge at work here. It can't just be unconscious social dynamics. So I got a Fulbright to travel around Africa for a year, interview people, and ask them why they're living in fractals, which is a great <laughs> job. Um, and uh, so this is what I found. So I, I uh, went to this uh, village in Cameroon uh, and uh, was asked them about this fractal structure. And it turns out that um, this is a path through the palace here. So it looks very scrambled. But as you go through, you realize it's a, it's a very linear uh, scaling spiral. Um, and the farther uh, closer to the throne room you go, the more polite you have to get. So there's kind of mapping a scaling hierarchy, uh, a social scaling hierarchy onto that geometric hierarchy. And the royal insignia is, in fact, a rectangle inside of a rectangle inside of a rectangle. Um, so I couldn't have been more wrong about um, it being unconscious. It's a very conscious uh, kind of heritage algorithm. Um, and we can um, uh, uh, play around with those algorithms just like we do any other algorithm. So it, it, it sort of makes that uh, cultural capital more fungible in a sense. 
Um, this is a Baila village in southern Zambia. Uh, it's a huge 400-meter uh, diameter ring, um, and it's a, a, a sort of a ring of rings. So as you uh, go outward here, the rings get larger and larger. That's the chief's extended family. That's the chief's immediate family. And then there's even a smaller ring that's, that's only about this big, right? Um, and you might wonder, how do people fit into a village that's only that big? But those are spirit people. They're not flesh people. So you have the ancestors' village. And of course, those ancestors have ancestors that are in a smaller village. So, so it's, it's uh, recursion all the way down. Um, this is uh, Benoit Mandelbrot's favorite uh, image. He's the father of fractal geometry. And, and so uh, I'll often get texts from somebody saying, you know, I just went and saw Mandelbrot, and he's got slides from your book. Um, so so uh, here you can see that, uh, that Baila village uh, uh, algorithm. Um, here's the um, single, single uh, room uh, house and the sacred altars towards the back. Um, here's the, the house of houses, a single ring, a corral, and the human habitation is towards the back. And here's the house of house of houses, and you can see the royal habitation is towards the back. So these are just beautifully uh, coherent systems, uh, very much embedded in local uh, spiritual beliefs, ecological practices, and so on. Uh, a wedding blanket, Fulani wedding blanket, and um, some cornrow hairstyles. So let me switch back here to uh, my slideshow. Let's zoom down inside of one of these uh, houses. So here we are in uh, uh, Mali and Burkina Faso uh, with a group that has this uh, image of a snake biting its own tail uh, on the walls. You can see the pots uh, inside of pots, inside of pots, these, these stacks of calabashes and gourds. Um, some beautiful uh, fractal uh, uh, structures in these Ethiopian crosses and the Fulani wedding blanket. Um, there's also some Euclidean design. So some of these scaling shapes also take advantage of what you would find in a, a class that's on uh, compass and, and straight edge construction. Um, every once in a while, I'll give this presentation to, to some mathematicians. And they'll challenge me. They'll say, well, yes, you're drawing pretty pictures. But math is about numbers. Is there anything here that's actually numeric? Um, and Awari, you guys know the game Moncala, Awari, so you put little pebbles in the cups. It's a great example of that. Um, so you've got what they call the marching group. If you have a uh, four, three, two, one sequence, you scoop from the first cup and plant your seeds in the next ones, and you replicated it. And so this will go marching around the, the board with each move. Um, and so uh, you can treat it as a one-dimensional cellular automaton and ask, um, what are the basins of attraction? Where are these marching formations occurring? Um, and they're occurring when you have the total number of counters of 1, 3, 6, 10, 15. So it's the triangle number sequence. Um, and that same triangle number sequence will occur in other African games, N not because they're obsessed with triangle numbers, but just because that's a signature of self-organizing systems. That's the commonality between all these different cultures, is they're using those self-organizing principles as both a spiritual basis uh, and a kind of design principle. Um, I published an article on this in the French edition of Scientific American, uh, La Scientifique, um, and some French mathematicians spotted it and said, well, that's not math. What you need are proofs and theorems. So they published this uh, beautiful little paper on uh, periodical states and marching groups in a closed Awari. And so now there's a little literature on, on Awari theorems that's out there. Um, so I was excited about that because finally we had knowledge going in the wrong way. You know, there's all these little teaching magazines on multicultural math, but it's things like how to count to 10 in Yoruba, or an African house is shaped like a cylinder. You know, it, in, a, in a sense, it only encourages folks to think of these as primitive cultures, right? Their math is relevant up to about grade three. Um, so this is a completely different way of thinking about uh, uh, indigenous knowledge systems. These um, Adinkra stamps um, I'm, I'm very obsessed with, and um, I've been taking my students on trips to West Africa uh, to hang out with these folks in part because they're, they're just such a pleasure to be with. You know, you, you um, hang out with folks who, who's, whose job is, is also their first love. And um, 
it's, it just renews your spirit, you know. So I'll, I'll, I'll pass around a few of these little stamps. They're beautifully carved uh, um, stamps. And you can feel the uh, ink on the, the cloth. They make their own ink. Um, so I noticed that uh, a lot of their stamps were using logarithmic spirals representing these um, scaling structures in nature. Um, and one of the stamps, uh, Giname, uh, is not representing any one particular creature. It's representing the power of life. So the, the little bumps down here are the fist, the power sign, right? And the curves are the curves of life. So they've, they've looked across all the different instances of log spirals, realized they were coming from living things, and then said, well, that must be sort of the life principle, the animist force. Um, so they, too, are generalizing across particular cases. They're doing what mathematical modeling is all about. All right. So I um, wrote this book, African Fractals, started handing it out to math teachers, thinking, well, my job is now done. We're going to have African mathematics in the classroom. And the math teachers had this interesting reaction. A lot of them teach in the inner city. They say, I have lots of, of African-American students. They're struggling in my math class. But your book isn't going to help because those are dusty museum artifacts. These kids do not know anything about Africa. And fractal geometry is a university level, uh, a, a university level topic. Um, so first, you know, they're saying this culture is too primitive to use in a math class. Now they're saying it's too sophisticated. You can't win for losing. So, so I asked them, out of everything in the book, what do you folks think would be the most relevant for these kids? And everybody had the same answer. They said it's the, the cornrow hairstyles. It's fractals in these braiding patterns because that's part of the, the, uh, that fractal heritage that made it through the middle passage. Um, and so that was the first uh, uh, project we did. Um, and I, I, I did it all in, in uh, my terrible Java coding. Um, but it was enough to get us an NSF grant uh, to really take this on seriously. So when we bring this to a classroom or summer camp or whatever it is, um, the first thing I do is ask the kids, well, you guys know where cornrow braiding comes from, right? And they all say, yeah, it comes from Brooklyn. So we realized that it wasn't just teaching them about the math. You really had to um, teach the cultural back, because where else are they going to get the history of cornrows, right, in a regular curriculum? Um, so we break up the kids into four groups. We have them study our African origins, where they learn about what these, um, the meanings that are encoded in these hairstyles. It's very meaningful uh, uh, representation of your marital status and, and which moiety you're, you're in and so on. Um, the middle passage, uh, the, the civil rights uh, moment, where these are, are starting to come back into style, and then contemporary hip hop. Um, now. Uh, when the kids who's, who's, who are assigned the middle passage uh, are asked to represent what they found, um, they always pick this little line here that says that um, uh, uh, heads were shaved ostensibly for sanitary reasons. And then I have to give them a little prompt. Really? That's all, that's all it says? The, the, the slave owner was, was beneficially you know, help looking out for their health? And they'll kind of ham and haw and say, well, no, it, it says, the, the psychological impact of being stripped of one's culture. What does that mean? So now they have to go back to the first group that talked about the meaning of the hair, right? So it starts to sort of knit together. Um, but in a way, it's really about giving them permission. Because I, I know when I was in engineering school, I would raise my hand in my differential equations class and say, what about the politics? And they'd say, well, this is differential equations, dummy. There's no politics here. Um, so having permission to actually talk about this stuff in the context of a math class is in itself a little bit of an insurrection. And, and you have to give the students the signal that this is actually okay. Um, and once that happens, it just really changes their relationship uh, to the material. So, so um, uh, we go through a little tutorial, and, and then uh, we, we uh, unleash them into the, uh, the software. They, they, they can uh, do these designs in, in any way they see fit. Uh, they can add in uh, color and multiple braids and so on. Um, so uh, let me just get my <coughs> slide going here. Um, so uh, once we saw that this was really going to work, um, we decided we would try expanding to different groups. Uh, and I got this call from some colleagues out in um, Utah asking me to um, come there and find fractals in Native American culture. 
And I said, well, you know, there's a whole chapter in the African fractals book on why there isn't fractals in Native American culture, because they're using fourfold symmetry, right? The four winds, the four directions, four sacred mountains. Um, so they said, well, come out anyways. So um, I found them doing this fantastic beadwork, and of course it fits right onto the Cartesian coordinate system. Um, so it's, it's turned out to be one of our most popular applications. Uh, teachers never complain about uh, using Cartesian coordinate systems in the classroom because it's the foundation for you know, uh, geometric uh, 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 analytic geometry and, and algebra and so on. Um, there's our friend, the Adinkra curves. Um, this was a complete miserable failure, which I also found really interesting. So I had Latino uh, math professors who said, oh, you've got to do Mayan pyramids. You know, give us a 3D virtual model that, that the kids can, can recreate. Um, and the, the, it was, I guess, a generational thing. The, the Latino kids we worked with um, just said, yeah, that, that's nice. Uh, but I think if it was you know, a lowrider car that they could design, it would have been a much better connection for them. Um, so in addition to these um, indigenous cultures, we've been getting ideas from the kids about what they wanted to see simulated, you know, what they felt their generation had uh, cultural ownership over. Because it's really a matter, you, they, they don't have ownership over math until you can show them something that they have cultural ownership over, and then it, it starts to make that, that connection for them. Um, so these are some of the ideas they came up with. If I have time, I'll, I'll show folks these. Um, and then we want kids to reflect on their designs. You're not just making pretty pictures because you've just gone through you know, a 200-year history of these things. So uh, what are you going to say as, a, as an artist who's, who's now simulated these designs using these uh, heritage algorithms? Um, so some of them say it in a very positive way. These are both uh, uh, Navajo students. Um, this Navajo student, The Clash of Two Worlds, um, says, um, when two worlds collide in the center, it's an intermingle of cultures, almost a bliss like nirvana, an understanding or an invasion. The connection creates an explosion that neither world can control. Our secrets burst away from us. Um, and and um, I think if you were going to provide an open system for these kids to really start using math and computing as an expressive medium, um, you have to take into account that not everything they say is going to be, you know, happy. Um, they're going to start talking about the things that they're critical of, including you, and, and being able to embrace that and say, well, that was the purpose we created this, was so you could get those ideas out there and get folks listening to you, uh, I think is more empowering for the kids than if we were trying to shut it down somehow. Um, so a lot of what we've done is just try to come up with a set of practices that respects local folks. Um, you really want to start with people who, uh, in some sense, uh, are representatives of the tradition who can say, yes, uh, th that is sacred and you can't touch it, um, and this is okay and you can do that. And it's not clear from the outset because a lot of that stuff is, is out there, and until you start these conversations, um, you don't know. Um, and then we don't want to impose our math and computing ideas on the material. We want that to come from them. And so there's a lot of conversations that are just, you know, following somebody through the, the woods when they select which piece of bark to strip off of which species of tree before you ever get to the geometry. Um, so so you, ha you have to sort of follow the, the, the path that, that they're doing. Um, but it really, it really pays off. So we've been doing these controlled studies where we have um, one course that's taught the traditional way, one course that's taught through the cultural material, uh, and we're able to show statistically significant improvement for the kids using the cultural material. And that's what's really uh, uh, gotten the, the NSF interested in, in supporting us. Part three. So at this point, I felt like, well, we've been pretty successful. So we've got now, uh, say, a more diverse STEM workforce. Um, and now it's producing you know, uh, nuclear weapons and pesticides. But it's a more diverse group of people that are doing that. Is that really the kind of visionary transformation of the world we had in mind? Um, clearly not. Um, and so we, we, we realized we needed to do more than, than what we were doing. So we started with um, Karl Marx, awesome critique of capitalism. Um, and and uh, there's a great book by Wendling uh, about Marx and alienation, talking about his relationship to the, the early science of thermodynamics, because he was such a geek. He was really into these early scientific theories of what is energy and how is energy transferred. Um, and so he had this sense that um, nature is this kind of, of self-generating source of value, something like the African systems I was referring to earlier, and that labor is the same way, right? Um, 
but capital can come in here and extract that value. Um, so you have this little equation, surplus value uh, equals the um, uh, extracted value minus the, the uh, use value. And so I started to realize, well, this explains why Marxism has failed so miserably when you look at its actual real world application. So you look at the USSR or Nepal or Cuba, um, and you see these, these failures, this massive amount of um, pollution. In fact, the, uh, if you look at the most polluting uh, companies in China today, they're all state owned. Those, those are not private capital. Um, the same thing with, with labor exploitation, the same thing uh, with uh, wealth inequality. So, so, so somehow the fact that um, you're doing that extractive process of pulling value out of these communities and alienating it, uh, whether the, those are profits going to the owner or profits going to the state that's supposedly going to get redistributed. You notice my ghost re redistribution here. Um, it's still extraction. Um, and so we came to the conclusion that it was really extraction was the problem, not whether it's delivered to, to uh, uh, company owners or, or to these states. And if you look at this uh, satellite photo, you can see the USSR here, this, this desertification that's going on, um, Mongolian herders doing their own thing down here, lush green landscape. So there was something about that indigenous tradition that was keeping value in an unalienated form. Um, and that's what we were really after. And part of that was, was um, you know, when you look at, at these uh, intense little beads in Native American beadwork, or these intense little braids in the fractal uh, structures of cornrows, um, it's really about making value visible. So, so if I went to work here in Ann Arbor, and after work I go to the parking lot, and I notice my boss is stuffing 10,000 ears of corn in, in the trunk of his car, I'd be pissed off. I'm getting ripped off. You know, he's getting all this wealth, I'm getting nothing. But I'll never see that. Capital makes that wealth transfer invisible, right? Um, and so when you look at these indigenous cultures, a lot of that work is going into making sure that, that the value is visible. So, so, um, so you can actually see, you know, look at all the love my friend showed me. She spent three hours braiding my hair this morning, or six hours. Um, and thinking about this, you know, I got my master's in systems engineering. Um, I did my doctorate in history of consciousness with Donna Haraway. Um, that probably explains a lot right there. Um, but, th but thinking about this as a systems engineer, I started to realize you could track that unalienated value as it flowed through the system and sort of see these little checks and balances they were using to make sure that things were being shared, um, like the idea of a commons. So this Adinkra symbol uh, is two crocodiles that share the same stomach. Uh, and every symbol is a saying that goes with it. And the saying is, you know, if we're fighting amongst ourselves, uh, it's pointless because when I feed you, I feed myself, right? Um, we were doing this with some kids doing these simulations, and one of them started talking about how he was going to get a tattoo on his arm uh, of this symbol. And I thought, oh, geez, you know, then his mom is going to complain. <laughs> They're tattooing in math class. You've got to shut it down. Um, but, but uh, these are ecological sustainability sources as well. So the, the, when we interviewed them about the, I don't know where my little red uh, fabric went to, if you just, uh, uh, uh. so, so um, we were interviewing folks about that ink, um, and they're getting that bark from trees and boiling it down. But those forests are preserved. Nobody's cutting them down for firewood or for, or for farms, um, in part because you're just making so much money off of that bark uh, as ink, why would you want to you know, kill the, the goose that's laying the golden egg? Um, but also because they're tied into a system of sacred forests. So this is like a church, but it's, it's out in the, in the ecosystem. Um, so my thought was that we could apply some of that same um, uh, systems networking to uh, modern uh, contemporary high-tech systems. Um, so so uh, during the introduction, as she was mentioning, um, uh, open source and maker spaces, I was thinking, gosh, I, I, I really sound pathetic. Do I really think that somehow that's just going to transform society? Um, and, I, and I don't, but um, I think once you can create an ecosystem of those kind of bottom-up uh, artisanal economies, then you, you have a chance. Now, part of the problem <laughs> is the fact that when they're using an Arduino board, 
Um, and, and I have an emotional relationship with Arduino boards that I, I just can't begin to describe. Um, but when you're using these Arduino boards, um, in part you're using mass-produced chips, right? Um, and so you can't really say that you've now sort of liberated value in a system that has that going on. You have to be aware of that. But we can do what we can to sort of shrink that part of the network. Over here, you have open source sharing and nobody's making a profit. And so you've completely liberated the value, um, but it's hard to say that we're actually going to be able to base a society on something in which nobody's making any money. So I think the most interesting quadrant here is, is and I'm representing that with uh, 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 Leah Beakley's uh, lily pad Arduino. Um, I think the most interesting quadrant is where you have these hybrid systems that are both completely open source, um, but also have some kind of profit stream going on. Um, and so to me, that's really where a lot of the action is, uh, where we can expand things in this uh, kind of social entrepreneurship fashion. Um, now, of course, this isn't the first time in history this has happened. So if you look at the history of worker collectives, for example, um, there's lots of, uh, of instances in which workers just own the workplace. They own the means of production. Um, one of my favorite ones is the Prague Spring. So 1968 in Czechoslovakia, they said, well, we don't have to do the, the communism the way everybody else does. Let's do our own version of it. And let's have industrial democracy. Instead of the Politburo in Moscow, we'll just have the workers on the shop floor decide what they're going to do, what products they're going to make, what the work times are. right? Um, and that's why in 1968, a few months later, Soviet tanks roll into Prague, right? We have to shut that down. That's the problem with extractive systems, is once you carry that wealth off somewhere else, it creates the incentive to keep that going, even if you're in a communist state. But the same thing was happening at the same historical moment in the US. So General Electric decides in 1968, they're going to have a worker self-management program. And they're going to do basically the same thing they were trying to do in Prague. It wasn't Soviet tanks, it was GE management that shut the whole thing down, um, but it was for similar reasons. So if you think about uh, generative justice, it's really orthogonal to the socialism capitalism spectrum, right? You have extractive systems can be either in socialism and capitalism, and generative systems can be in either socialism or capitalism. Um, now I have a host of sort of postmodernist questions that I've, I've been throwing at my uh, uh, my doctoral students uh, in, a, in a grad seminar, so it's sort of on my mind. Uh, but I was so excited that uh, uh, Rebecca's here today, and, and um, uh, the, the, her uh, bougie crap essay, if you haven't read it, is, is just mind-blowing. It finally gave me a sense of how do you do a critique of fake authenticity. So if I'm so interested in unalienated labor, you know, how do I take into effect that Tostitos now makes an artisanal chip, yeah. right? Or, you know, I look at my cookie package and it says that it's made by Keebler elves and there's even like a picture of their workshop, but they don't exist. There's no such thing as Keebler elves. Um, and then we have the challenge just pra in practical sense, how do we actually implement this uh, as a system? Um, and so we've come up with some, some principles. Um, a, a, as I mentioned, we've gotten some terrific support from the National Science Foundation. Uh, so this is uh, Professor Bennett. Um, one of my grad students here, uh, a couple of my kids over there that we brought with us. Um, and so we've been doing these, these collaborative exercises. Um, we had uh, uh, faculty from engineering and science, as well as from social sciences involved. Uh, this is a student we brought over from Ghana. Uh, Shayla Sawyer is a professor of nanotechnology. She was doing these little sensors for the nuclear industry, and so we said, ah, well, we can use these out on the Navajo reservation where we've been studying uh, weaving patterns uh, because they're suffering from a lot of uh, reproductive cancers that are caused by uranium tailings. Um, what about VOC? What about volatile organic compounds, pollution from oil and coal? And she said, well, you, you can't do that. These are, are nano, uh, metallic nanoparticles. They won't interact with organic systems. And then she kind of stopped in mid-sentence. She said, well, you know, nobody's actually tried embedding an organic molecule in the nano substrate. It's become a whole research uh, line for her now. Um, so I was really excited to see again information traveling in the wrong direction that you know you don't have to go to, to GE and IBM to do cutting-edge high-tech innovation. You can get ideas from these low-income communities and, and still have it 
uh, push the envelope of what the technology can do. Um, again, you know, the, these uh, uh, seminars I go to where somebody says, well, we're going to get these low-income kids, and we're going to train them as scientists, and then they're going to leave this community. Um, it's, a, it's a strange argument. You're going to make them wealthy by turning them into you, so they no longer live with the folks that they grew up with. How is that, exactly is that transformative? Um, so, we, so we started wondering, well, well, what if we said the output of the STEM pipeline, we know you want to diversify the input, the students, but what if the output, the things coming out of the pipeline, um, were actually going to these communities, right? How do you set up these generative cycles? Um, so we've, we've been looking at our, um, our braiding simulations and starting to think about how they could actually be connected to uh, these little braiding shops, because you've got these great little mom and pop size uh, uh, cosmetology shops where people are still using these African traditions. In fact, a lot of them are African immigrants. Um, and uh, we brought some of them into RPI and they were just so excited. They said, you know, nobody's ever asked us to get together as a group before. I know where your shop is, I know where your shop is, but we never get together, right? Um, and so uh, they've been exper experimenting with uh, pH sensors. This ha had some ideas about innovation they could do around hair uh, damage testing. Uh, uh, one of the students has already sold 20 units of this uh, new product, hair product that she's made in this workshop. Um, the students are installing these uh, 3D printed mannequins. So they took the designs they created, made mannequin heads, and now they're going to measure to see if they can get an increase in the number of customers coming in. Um, we have a new project. We're just starting this month um, taking those uh, braiding algorithms and using it on carbon fiber uh, and then creating some bike helmets. And we have a destructive testing lab that's, that's involved that's going to see if we can show that you can actually get better uh, bike helmets using braiding algorithms than, than regular Cartesian weaves. Uh, this is e-waste to makerspace. Uh, it's a project we've been doing in part just because a lot of low-income communities can't afford to buy, you know, $1,000 worth of stepper motors and Arduinos. Um, but there's tons of, of waste, uh, old printers and whatnot, just going into the, the waste stream and creating toxic soils. Um, so we, we've been um, doing some work with uh, teaching kids how to uh, 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 um, uh, render those as, as, as sort of designs of their own creation. Uh, let me see if I can rewind this here. A bunch of random parts, my favorite line. <laughs> so so, um, uh, so I, I visited uh, Ecuador uh, uh, last fall and uh, talked to some folks on the Galapagos Islands who are extremely concerned about the amount of e-waste that's being produced and their school wanted to create a little makerspace. So I said, oh, I've got the, the perfect solution for you. Just put your problem and your, and your desire together uh, and, and, uh, and you've got the whole thing worked out. Um, I've also been working with architects uh, so how do you uh, get those African designs back into communities? You know, Africa for, for uh, uh, years and years and years um, has been using European designs in its buildings. And when they're African designs, it's always like a giant mask. Just like you go to somebody and say, we want to use Native American architecture, and they say, oh, we'll make a giant teepee. You know, what a failure of the imagination, right? Um, so Xavier Vialta is an architect who's been doing a lot of work in Ethiopia. Uh, and um, so we've, we've been uh, uh, dialoguing back and forth on, on how to use these things to improve. Because uh, the lungs are, are fractals, right? Um, so if the exterior skin of a building could breathe the way lungs can breathe, um, you can actually reduce the air conditioning requirements. Um, when you create fractal layouts for a school, as he's done here, you create little nooks and crannies where students can meet together in, in otherwise what would be a, a fairly alienating space. Um, I mentioned to you that the uh, Ghanaians already had this, this generative cycle uh, they were using in bark. So we just wanted to enhance that. Um, if you can replace their wood fires, these things burn for like three days to boil this down to ink. Uh, if you can replace those expensive uh, and carbon producing uh, wood fires with solar energy, uh, then you've made it cheaper and you've made it more ecologically sustainable and you've actually sustained the uh, cultural practice as well. Um, so that seemed like a win-win-win. Um, their, the school uh, in that particular village had four computers for 800 students. Um, so we asked the uh, carver, so you've, you've seen these um, stamps. 
uh, I told the carver that I wanted some stamps that were only a, a, an inch square. Uh, and his, his, you know, he wasn't there, his brother was there. And he said, that's physically impossible. You cannot make stamps that small. Uh, and his brother finally showed up. And when I told him what I wanted, his eyes just lit up. It's like he's been waiting his whole life for somebody to ask him for this. Uh, and we came back the next day, and his hands were bloody. He had all these nicks. And he said, you know, I've never done anything like this before. It was so exciting. Um, so they, they have the school um, using, we, we took our virtual uh, 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 block-based programming and made physical blocks. Um, so the kids all have a set of these physical blocks. Um, and then they use the miniature stamps to stamp what they believe the algorithm they've created is. And then the teacher checks it on the one computer in the classroom. And so that way, one computer is serving all these students. Um, but you've now created a new revenue stream for the folks producing that ink. And the more ink that gets produced, the more forest that gets saved. So once you start these generative cycles, they can, they can really grow in a, in a kind of viral way. Um, we've burned some, our, all, everything we do is open source, blueprint software, everything. Um, so we've burned some of our software to, to CD drives and ha had artisans selling it. Um, this is a uh, HIV project. How much more time do I have? Uh, maybe five minutes. Five minutes. Okay, this is a uh, HIV prevention project uh, that um, uh, uh, Professor Bennett was involved with. She was working with them um, to take some of the traditional symbols uh, and use them for HIV prevention. So the, the bird with its beak pointed backwards means you can always go back for a tradition. Um, so the slogan here was, um, you can always go back for a condom. It's have a little condom in its beak. Uh, we, 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 we generated a bunch of ideas, but that was the favorite of everyone. So that, that was one of the ones that, that, that made it through the process. Um, and then we used the Adinkra uh, artisans' uh, help to stamp those on some cloth. Um, and we used a, a DIY condom vending machine. I had my engineering students design this. Um, it's, it's now been reproduced uh, uh, several times, but they've, they've also modified it and created their own version to hold other uh, reproductive health items. And that, to me, was, was the big win, that um, it wasn't just that, that we had open sourced it so they wouldn't get sued. Um, we had open sourced it so that it could mutate, right? So that it could start to fill these other uh, kinds of niches and generate other kinds of value. Um, so the, so the, 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 the big picture was to, was to create this sort of generative network that reinforced itself. Um, and you know, the, there, there's, there's uh, uh, plenty of failures to be had in that. Um, but it's also just been exciting to see this stuff uh, float off in other directions. So, so if you're on a, a long airplane trip and you're looking for a really engaging book, um, I recommend Binti by Anetti Okafor. Uh, and it's full of fractals and math encoding and cornrow braiding. Uh, and so I contacted her and said, you know, I was so excited she was using her stuff. Can we use some patches from the book? So we now have a sci-fi uh, software tool that we're developing uh, with her. Uh, so you can see a kind of generative cycle uh, uh, bringing value back to these communities. And I'll stop there. Thank you. <laughs> Questions? Yes, sir. I'm curious to hear some of um, uh, your thoughts on the contrast between largely traditional knowledge, indigenous knowledge, vernacular, how the idea of the commons there is yeah. thought of very differently, and how when we look at Western traditions and start to think about Lloyd and all of his writing and thinking about the tragedy of the commons. Right, right. And that's kind of the space that we're sitting in right now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, I, 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 you know, these are really old ideas. So, so uh, today is the, the anniversary of uh, Martin Luther King's assassination. Um, and uh, some of those images you'll see of, of King in his little study, you'll notice there's a picture of uh, Mahatma Gandhi on the back wall. Um, and uh, King actually traveled to India. He was, he was so, you know, uh, 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 en entranced by this model of nonviolent action, and it worked. It really it, that was the key, right? Um, but uh, Gandhi got the idea when he was in South Africa. He was a, a newspaper editor, um, and he had received a letter from Tolstoy in Russia, uh, titled "Open Letter to a Hindu," um, and it was it was full of this idea of. Um, sort of uh, self-awareness, uh, self-controlling systems, self-organizing systems. You know, Tolstoy was kind of a Christian anarchist. Um, 
And Tolstoy got the idea from uh, Kropotkin. Some of you know about Prince Kropotkin. Um, and he uh, was uh, of royal heritage uh, in, the, in the, the Russian court um, and was reading Darwin about the, the, uh, the war of all against all, this sort of Hobbesian picture of nature, um, and went on these expeditions to Siberia um, and predicted that the harsher the environment got, uh, the more harshly people would treat each other. Right? Um, and he found it wasn't true. The worse things got, the better people were. Come into our, our yurt, have some yak butter. You know, um, so he wrote this book, Mutual Aid, and he said it's not just humans; it's in the it's in the animal world too. So you look at uh, the shore of a lake, and you'll see birds of different species all together feeding together, not fighting over the food, right? And when a predator comes, one gives a cry, and they all fly off together. They're protecting each other. He said nature is full of these examples of cooperation, competition. Sure, it's there, but it's not the only force at work, right? Um, so he renounced his princehood and um, went off and became an anarchist and visited uh, 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 the Jura Mountains in Switzerland because he had heard about these watchmakers that had somehow um, stood up against both giant corporations trying to put them out of business, but also stood up against uh, Marx and the First International when they tried to centralize. Um, and and, and uh, he writes in his, in his book about how you know, I didn't really understand what anarchism was until I visited these watch, the Jura watchmakers. Uh, and he, he said, you go into a factory and you're alienated. You go into these Jura villages and everybody's together, you know, in the house, multi-generational. They're having intellectual conversations as they, there's no boss because they own the workplace, right? Um, so I think, I think that, that commons appears in all kinds of, of surprising places in, in Swiss watchmakers and different indigenous societies. Um, and it's, it's quite ancient. You, know, you can go all the way back to uh, uh, Plato and Socrates having this idea of, of the philosopher king, right? So we're going to have a hierarchical society that's ruled from the top down. But then you have a philosopher like Democritus. Um, and if you look at, in your um, uh, Introduction to Chemistry, Chem 1 textbook, it'll say the first person to, to theorize atoms was Democritus. They don't mention that he's, also, he's not only the father of chemistry, he's the father of democracy. And the reason he was talking about um, atoms creating the character of different substances is because he said people create the character of different societies. Um, so a lot of these ideas go way back and appear in all kinds of fascinating uh, different forms. Another question? Yeah. Oh. Um, I was struck by that image that you had of the sort of STEM future on one hand and the corporate mogos on the other. Yeah. That so often we think of these as reskilling or preparing for a new economy, but they're always rooted in the same type of production. Like the education is to get a job rather than the education is to ask bigger questions in life. So I'm curious. Yeah. But I'm, I'm curious about when that comes in, say, when you work with, with youth either in the U.S. or in Ghana. Yeah. Are those types of conversations part of the workshops, or are the workshops sort of heuristics for people figuring it out? No, no. We, 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 uh, oh, you, you, you put your, your finger right on it. So, so we're trying to work against that instrumental view that humans can be reduced to human resources, right? Um, and so how do you have this other kind of uh, a conversation occurring. And that's why I mentioned that part about the, the uh, students talking about hairstyles in relationship to the slave trade, right? That, that they've been so disciplined not to have that kind of conversation in, in the context of something like a math class um, that it's really difficult to get out. I, I, sh I should also say, you know, I, I think there's some symmetry there. So we, we talk about um, the sort of cruelty of, of being an artistic, humanistic person uh, in the context of a math class, right? Uh, um, but I, th I think when I talk to engineering students, you know, they sort of feel they've suffered as nerds, right? They're, they're, they're sort of saddled with this feeling of, of, of contempt. Um, and so I, th I think some nurturing needs to happen on that side as, as well. But, but that's definitely a, a goal of ours is to make those conversations happen. Um, we, we did a, a, a project here in Michigan uh, uh, recently with um, uh, Anishinaabe kids um, 
working with these, uh, sorry, uh, where's our quilts? Uh, so it was, it was uh, working with these quilt traditions uh, and one of the, uh, the women who, who does these quilts works with survivors of the boarding school system. Um, and so this is a story about her cutting one jelly bean into four pieces so she could share it with her friends. So the students just latched onto that and had this intense conversation about what their parents had told them about the effects of the boarding school system. And uh, it, it really just opens up the, that combination of geometric and, and, and social uh, uh, dialogue. Yeah, thanks for staying. Yes, sir. I had this, uh, well, first of all, thank you for what an excellent talk. Uh, I'm thinking about this notion of sailing and uh, resolution. Yeah. Because they belong together. Absolutely, yeah. Resolution, as you know, would be now. And in a social system, what is the end game? What is, how does the, how, how far can it go in scale, micro or macro? Yeah. Uh, because if you say, well, let's use nature, uh, and a tree can only grow so far. Right. Right? Right. <coughs> or a fish, or whatever. It is. Yeah. Um, how, so. How, how, how could we. Yeah. So, so, so um, this this is uh, the woman's room, the uh, uh, dago, um, and the, the dago is where the child is born. Um, so when you're when you're an infant, um, that's your whole world, right? Um, and they have an age grade initiation. So when you get to the point where you're a toddler, you move out from this world into this world, right? Um, and then when you're a youth, you move out from your family compound to the village as a whole. And then when you're an adult, you move out from the village as a whole to the world as a whole, right? Um, when, she, when she is, uh, when, when the, the woman dies, they have a ceremony um, where they smash these uh, stacks of gourds and, and pots. Um, and there's a little container, the smallest container, the compio, where they keep her soul. And so her soul goes off to infinity. So in the flesh realm, you're right, we're very limited, right? Um, but this is why people become mathematicians. Is that right? Yeah, because the fleshly, the fleshly limitations, you know, it, it, you feel like you're in a box. I like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I was, at, I was at a conference at an Ivy Covered University earlier this year, and I saw Yokai Benkler give a talk about his recent work. And he wrote a book a while back, The Wealth of Networks, and it yeah. has marks, and it has a whole bunch of your examples in it. It yeah. doesn't have generative justice, but it has some similar little yeah. bit of argument yeah. about bottom-up reconfiguration of production. He says the internet's going to produce it. You didn't say that. But anyway, there's a lot of similarities. Yeah. He starts to give his talk. He gets heckled. I mean. We're pretty polite. I didn't see any heckling of your talk. I was kind of taken aback by the fact that Yokai Minkler got heckled, but yeah. someone in the audience, you know, said, you know, that it's over, you lost. Um, and and I, I don't know if they were talking about Wikipedia particularly or which example you yeah. were talking about, yeah. right? You know, uh, it was that the premise of his book didn't turn out the way that he no, thought, no, I mean, right? The conference already was talking. It was about the future of the internet. Oh. So, so, um, <laughs> So anyway, um, I don't know. Like yeah. Jimmy Wales has been asking me for money a lot lately. So I mean, yeah. how do you put this kind of framework in conversation with uh, recent events? Or yeah. Maybe his work. Yeah. So 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 um, um, I go looking for trouble, and and as you can see, uh, and and so I've been um, trying to collect examples in which those things have failed. Um, and a lot of them are happening in physical spaces. So these maker spaces um, will be all male, right? Um, and, and so finding out what it is that, that's, that's sort of gender repellent uh, about these, these maker spaces, I think, is just as important as asking, you know, why uh, Benkler's vision is, has failed in some way. 
Um, so, so one of the things I, I always point out in these conversations is that if you went into a privately owned machine shop uh, 40 years ago or 50 years ago, and it was all men, you wouldn't bat an eye, right? Um, but as a, a feminist sociologist, you wouldn't be allowed into a privately owned machine shop. So the fact that these things are suddenly becoming public, I don't think um, is necessarily a failure. It's giving us a clue about the fact that these things have always been arranged in this way, but it never occurred to us that it was wrong. So in a, in a sense, the, the, the makerspace is sort of like the penny dreadful. You know, when the printing press first came out, um, it was not embraced. People were saying, well, that's the, that's the end of, you know, cl uh, classical literature, right? Um, and so the penny dreadful was often this example. Well, look, you know, you, you made it possible for just anybody to publish a book, and now you have garbage like detective novels. Um, what a ridiculous genre to think that anybody would waste their time reading that. Um, so there's always these, these sort of panics when you democratize things that it's going in the wrong direction. Um, so that's my point of view about a lot of this stuff, is, is that of course when you, when you finally open up a commons that was previously uh, privatized, it's, it's an argument, it's a negotiation, it's a tussle. Those are, those are uh, the makerspaces that are feminist makerspaces, right? Um, that's a hard-won victory, um, but that's a fight worth winning. And, and actually, I was just showing my, my students the other day the um, list of dispute rules on Wikipedia, and they were saying, oh, you know, that's tragic that you have disputes in Wikipedia. And I asked them, well, you know, what utopian future are you thinking of where everybody agrees on everything? Because I don't want to go there. It sounds dreadful, right? Um, I, th I actually think Wikipedia is a great laboratory for thinking through what does it take to, to engage in co collaboration with strangers in a commons. Um, and their dispute rec uh, resolution process is pretty darn good. Um, so I, I, you know, yes, people love to heckle this vision, um, but some of them are hardcore Marxists that just, uh, they have a lot invested in a future in which there's a central planning bureau. I just, um, uh, do, I, do I have time for one more question? Oh, okay. Just a really quick follow up to uh, Christine's question. Yeah. It sounds to me, if I understand your response, that the problem is not that Yokai Genshou is wrong, but that not enough people recognize why things need to be different. Is that? Said much better than I did, yes, thank you. Um, <laughs> Yeah, so, so uh, what, one of the examples I love to pull out, and I don't know if Benkler mentioned this, but if you look at the number of people reporting on their income tax, that their living comes from being a musician, um, it's, it's gone up exponentially ever since peer-to-peer -peer sharing allowed music to be shared, right? And what's happened is people are now giving their music away for free in order to build up enough of an audience to play live, and they're making far more money playing live than they ever would have with a recording contract anyways. So it's, it's really you know, de-alienated the music enjoyment process as well as just allowing more people to sustain that uh, as a for, uh, form of income. All right, thank you.